Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts, a free educational netcast bringing geology to all. On April 10th, 1912, the RMS Titanic famously set out from Southampton in Britain for New York City in the United States. It would not make it there. Historically, on April 15th, the Titanic sank beneath the waves after being struck by an iceberg. And thus began perhaps one of the most impressively large expeditions of humanity's works into the future, the geologic future. Because the RMS Titanic came to rest in sediments, the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, just off the coast of Newfoundland. This places it at the edge of the continental shelf, in a place where the oceanic crust is sutured tightly to the continent. And so it's very likely that the Titanic will remain where it is. For the next few million years, slowly being buried, a sediment accumulates around it. A silt, and mud, and organic remains from the continent's wash are carried by the currents to deposit over the remains of the Titanic. A few million years from now, it might be found by others who occupy this planet, and they will find it as a crushed layer of rusted iron trapped between sedimentary layers. And they will be able to look at the iron remains, the steel crushed into a flat plane between the thousands of tons of layers of rock above and below. And they'll be able to piece it together like a fossil, like we would take apart the bones of a whale that we find in marine sedimentary rock today. A lot of what we've produced that has been deposited into the oceans, like shipwrecks, will be fossils of the future, fossils of machines that we built, not of ourselves, but they will leave a mark. And that is what makes sedimentary rocks so fascinating. Sedimentary rocks are perhaps some of the most complex rocks in Earth's crust. They make up only a tiny fraction, about 5% of the upper continental crust, but they record a rich history of our planet in many different ways. And in this episode, I want to talk about sediments and sedimentary rock, starting with clastic sediments, sediments made out of weathered bits and pieces of pre-existing rock that have eroded. So I'll introduce a couple of terms here to start off. We're talking about clastic sedimentary rocks, and we're also talking about detrital clastic sedimentary rocks. So what's what's the deal with these terms? Clastic simply means it's composed out of pre-existing pieces. An iconoclast is someone who breaks an icon apart. A clastic rock is a rock made of parts. And so it could be, usually it's detrital material. Usually we're talking about detrital material, meaning detritus weathered, physically eroded from pre-existing rock and carried downstream by rivers, carried down the wind direction, uh, carried out to sea where it can accumulate in layers of sediment on the bottom. That's what we call detrital sediment. And most clastic sediment is detrital. There are a few exceptions. For the most part, what I want to talk about in this episode is the derivation of clastic detrital sedimentary rocks, because that covers most of the territory of rock that forms by the erosion of mountains. And that's where most of this comes from. Most sedimentary rock on Earth that's clastic detrital sediment is derived from the weathering of mountain ranges, the highest mountain ranges on Earth, the Alps, the Andes, the Himalayan mountains. All of these are high mountain ranges that are the highest peaks of them are above tree line. They're exposed. They actually experience some of the harshest weather conditions on Earth. And these mountains are constantly pounded by wind, by rain, by the freeze-thaw action as the seasons come and go, by rivers that form in channels eroding out from the mountain, eroding into the mountain's mass, rivers carrying this material down the mountainside where small tributary streams meet up with larger ones to larger rivers, and the material is carried out to the ocean, or at least to a large lake, perhaps. That's how most clastic detrital sediment forms. It's carried away downstream, sometimes by glaciers, usually by rivers, sometimes by wind, where it collects up, either at the surface, as vast sand dune deposits, for example, or underwater, which is more common. The accumulation of sediment in lakes eventually fills the lakes up and forms a basin full of layers of sediment that can be compacted down to form rock. In shallow sea environments, just off the continental shelf, sediments can pile up in layers that compact down on the continent and are less likely to be lost as ocean crust is destroyed through subduction, say. So these layers build up, they harden, they accumulate, and they record a history of the events that took place as they were forming. They record information about the ecology, about the landscape, about if was it a mountain stream carrying this material along to accumulate, or was it a slow big river like the Mississippi dumping material out into the Gulf of Mexico where it builds up in layers. There's a lot of different ways sediment can build up, and as it does so, it has then the opportunity, perhaps, or it might happen to it, that it is buried by further sediment on top, eventually buried deep enough where the heat and the pressure in the upper crust hardens this material into solid rock. It compacts all the spaces out between the grains, or most of them, and compacts this material into 
a hard rock that now doesn't behave like a collection of bits. It now behaves like, in some cases, a highly resistant material, like sandstone. So what is a sandstone anyway? What is sand, for that matter? And you might say quartz, but it doesn't have to be. Sand can be made of quartz, it can be made of feldspar, it can be made of olivine and pyroxene, like the black sand beaches of Hawaii. To a geologist, sand is not a compositional term so much as a size term, a grain size term. For sedimentary rocks, it's important to think about grain size because a coarse grain sedimentary rock is going to form under very different conditions than a very fine grain sedimentary rock. And I, I need to explain what I mean by coarse and fine. What's the scale I'm talking about here? Well, to look at the texture of a sedimentary rock, you look at the particle size. In most sedimentary rocks, the grains are more or less similar in size to each other. It's part of how sedimentary particles sort themselves out to form these bodies in the first place. But we'll get to that. So to a sedimentary geologist, a sedimentary rock that has particle sizes, it's made up of bits and pieces, and those bits and pieces are larger than about two millimeters in size, then that's pretty coarse. Those are big pieces, big chunks of rock that have to be carried by a lot of force to be moved to where they collect all together in one big pile, one big layer of loose sediment before it compacts to form rock. You're only going to start moving really heavy objects that are larger than two millimeters or on the scale of a centimeter with fast-moving water, say, or during a landslide. Fast-moving water in a stream bed can carry along pebbles quite easily, and they will sort themselves out by size, and they'll pile up, and piles of that material later compacted into rock we would call a conglomerate. A conglomerate is made out of pieces of carried sedimentary particle material that's been rounded by stream action. You typically don't get sedimentary materials with coarse grains unless a lot of forces move them around, which is why you get this other kind of coarse grain sediment called breccia. Breccia is made of pieces that are larger than a couple of millimeters, but they're not round. They're fragmented. They're angular. It's shards and bits of broken rock, and you get a breccia after something like a pretty violent landslide, volcanic eruption, uh, an impact that shatters the rock. Now, if you go to slightly smaller grain sizes, then you start going into the territory of what most people think of when they think of a sedimentary rock. The first thing that pops in your head is probably something having to do with the Grand Canyon or weathered outcrops in the desert southwest or something like that. That material is finer grains than a breccia or a conglomerate. You're talking about sediments that have grain sizes from about one to two millimeters in size. What we would consider a sand particle size. Sand is a grain size designation to a geologist. And so you can have coarse sands or fine sands, but it's at size range, not so much the composition, because we can describe the composition otherwise. We can say that it's a quartz sandstone or a feldspar rich sandstone, which we might call an arcose sandstone. So it doesn't really matter so much what the composition is. So coarse to medium grain sizes that would, we would call a sand grain size, they're carried with less force than would say carry pebbles in a con to form a conglomerate, but they're still carried along with fairly enough water movement that you can entrain particles that are, that are pretty coarse. What we would think of if you feel coarse sandpaper, that size of grain. And moving water can easily carry that stuff around, wind can carry it around. So sandstone compacted down from sand can be from many different origins. It can be from desert dunes. It can be, for that matter, from just offshore in lakes or more commonly in the ocean where rivers dump into the sea and as the river empties into a sea is going to slow down and whatever particles are being carried around typically just fall out and collect. That's why you build river delta. And close to where the river delta starts, where the river water slows down, is where you get most of your sand depositing. If you go further out, you get finer and finer grain material depositing because it can be carried further by the water. Water can carry fine grain silt material a really long way and it slowly settles down into layers of loose sediment. Silt is fine grain material technically designated as fine grain sediment, which the size range for that is from about 0.06 millimeters down to about 0.004 millimeters. You don't see the individual particles in hand sample the way you would easily in a sand. Silt deposits further out in depositional environments, further out from a lake shore into the deep parts of a lake, or further from shore out to sea, beyond where sand deposits. Silt will build up. If that stuff gets compacted down, it forms a silt stone. Finer still than that is clay. Clay-sized particles can be suspended in water for a long time and be carried a pretty good distance. And so clay deposits represent continuous sedimentary deposition, say from rivers into the ocean, 
into shallow sea on continental shelf environments where the sediment collects up and we can find it later. It doesn't get subducted. And clay deposits are material that's been traveling quite a distance because it is so fine-grained. Accumulations of very fine-grained sediment compact down to form rock types that we call shale or mudstone. Shale is very fine-grained. When it's compacted down, there's not enough space between the grains where water can even percolate through. It often forms a barrier to groundwater moving above or below it. Shale also can collect with a lot of organic matter. Typically when you're far enough out to sea that shale mud can collect, you're also collecting organic remains of algae and plankton with it. So that's why shales can often be rich with organic matter, black shales. So if you want to classify clastic sedimentary rocks on the basis of grain size, there's a classification scale that's used by geologists for this. If you have grains in a conglomerate, say, that are bigger than about four millimeters, up to hand size, those are pebbles and cobbles. Larger than that, we call them boulders. Smaller than that, smaller than that size of about four millimeters, you get to the range uh, down to granules, which are about two to four millimeters, and sand. Sand is about two millimeters grain size diameter down to actually about 0.06 millimeters. So that's very fine sand ranging all the way up to about two millimeters, which is the coarsest sand you have. Silt is sediment made of particles that are smaller than about 0.06 millimeters down to about 0.004. And anything smaller than that is clay. And clay takes a long time to settle and forms very fine-grained, flat-lying sediments.